Bonsoir tout le monde. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Catherine Spencer Ross, Chair of Heritage Ottawa's Lecture Series Committee. I'd like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to Heritage Week, which Heritage Ottawa celebrates with its annual Phillips Memorial Lecture. This year, our special guest speaker is Wanda Della Costa, who will talk about Indigenous design. At the end of tonight's lecture, Professor Peter Kaufman, Supervisor of Carleton University's History and Theory of Architecture Program, a Heritage Ottawa board member and member of our lecture series committee, will come on after the presentation and will moderate the questions and then close our event. Our lecture series is made possible through the generosity of our sponsor, Andrex Holdings Inc. and Sandy Smallwood. Andrex has been a faithful sponsor of these lectures, as well as of our walks and some publications. We're also grateful for an operations grant from the City of Ottawa and a heritage grant from the province of Ontario. I'd also like to thank those of you who have made donations to Heritage Ottawa and encourage this very concrete form of support. Your contributions support our work as the only citywide organization that speaks up for heritage properties at risk. It's hard and often costly work. I encourage you to join Heritage Ottawa if you are not yet a member and to make a financial contribution to the organization. Please connect with our website for information. I earlier referred to this evening's event as the Phillips Memorial Lecture. This annual event was inaugurated in 2006 and is dedicated to the founders more than 50 years ago of the organization that became Heritage Ottawa. Indeed, it can be said without exaggeration that Bob and Marianne Phillips, whose photos you see on the screen, were the founders of Built Heritage Consciousness and Advocacy in Ottawa. In 1967, during Canada's centenary, the Phillipses created an advocacy group called Capital for Canadians. Its Heritage Committee was the beginning of Heritage Ottawa, which was incorporated in 1974, and Bob Phillips was its first president. In the 1960s and 70s, with these organizations and a tremendous personal commitment, Bob and Marianne undertook information campaigns and public activism to save a number of key historic buildings and structures in Ottawa that were under threat. Structures as diverse as the Billings House, the Pretoria Bridge, and even the East Block of the Parliament Buildings and the Union Station. I think Bob and Marianne would be pleased with the theme of this evening's presentation. I understand that among the participants in tonight's Zoom meeting are Bob and Marianne's three daughters, Margaret, Jennifer, and Bridget. Welcome once again to the annual lecture that celebrates your parents and honors the strength of heritage consciousness in Ottawa and the National Capital Region. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Wanda Della Costa. Wanda is a member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation. She is also a mom, a practicing architect, and a professor. She was honored in 2019 by the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco and added to the YBCA 100, a list which celebrates people, organizations, and movements shifting culture through ideas, their art, and their activism. At Arizona State University, she is the director and founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative, a community-driven design and construction program which brings together tribal community members, industry, and a multidisciplinary team of ASU students and faculty to co-design and co-develop solutions for tribal communities. Her teaching and research is focused on indigenous ways of knowing and being, co-design methodologies, sustainable design, and the resiliency of vernacular architectures. In terms of her practice, Wanda was the first First Nation woman to become an architect in Canada. Her firm, Tawau Architectural Collective, is based in Phoenix, Arizona. Recent projects include the Indigenous Embassy in Ottawa, an Indigenous Urban Early Learning Centre in Saskatoon, and a tribal college in Alberta. Wanda was also invited to the 2018 Venice Biennale World Festival in Architecture as part of Unseated, where she joined 18 Indigenous architects from across Turtle Island 
to share an indigenous vision of the future. Wanda holds a Master of Design Research in City Design from Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles and a Master of Architecture from the University of Calgary. I'd like to add our heartiest congratulations to Wanda who just last month was named the 2022 Honorary Fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. And with that, Wanda, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, appreciate the introduction. Uh, I would like to share with you today, um, I guess the, the work that I have been doing over the last 30 or so years. And this is a very interesting time that we're sharing this work. We have just finished two years of a global pandemic, which as many of you know, has presented unprecedented and drastic changes across a variety of fronts, disrupting conventional approaches to a wide range of activities, including architecture. It was Marco Polo, uh, the chair uh, over at the Society for the Study of Architecture in Canada, who shared this statement, saying that things are changing. It, he said, the way we teach is changing. I also believe the practice is changing. For me, I miss walking the land with my clients. I miss their stories connected to place and space. I miss learning firsthand about their story landscape, which they grew up in and holds generations of knowledge in those landscapes. I miss learning about the biomes that are based in the lived experience of those people. And I'm hoping that this by this summer, we'll be back on the land again with the people from these communities. Our work, as many of you may guess, is about building connections. It is about awareness, but ultimately it's really about building connections. It's about relationships between all living things, the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged ones, the feathered ones, even plants and rocks and mountains are who we believe are in the circle of living things that we are working within. The pandemic for our firm has renewed our commitment to working in place with the people of the place. So please join me in exploring this subject this evening, which I believe, um, as many of you can guess, is emerging quite quickly these days. The work I specialize in, Indigenous architecture, is quite a niche. I am both a practitioner with my own practice that spans Canada and the US, but I'm also a scholar. I teach at Arizona State University, as, um, as um, Catherine mentioned. My practice is extremely niche. I've been what I consider on the fringe of architecture for a very long time. But something's happened in the last 10 or so years where I don't feel like I'm on the fringe. Uh, it was about 10 years ago that my phone started ringing and people were, started to be interested in this work. I did my studies back in the 90s at the University of, of Calgary and Indigenous architecture wasn't even a thing back then. There were very few resources to lean on, a few outdated books talking about typologies and speculating meaning, very little authenticity I found out once I started teaching. An example, I had a Hopi student, a graduate student, and she was enraged with a book that we were studying because it didn't accurately portray her culture. Thankfully, I think now we're at a time where those, um, I guess that um, the meanings are starting to be more authentic and more representational of the cultures as more people are looking into this subject and becoming experts in the field. I feel I am no longer on the fringe of this. I feel like the fringe is starting to become the field and I'm very hopeful for the future of architecture. I have spent about 11 years in the US. I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, that's where I grew up. Um, but now I also know, and I think this is important for this topic, for the topic today, that the US is positioned to become a majority non-white population by 2050. I'm sure many of you have heard that. Meaning that there will be more minority people in the US than Caucasian people in this country. What does that mean? You know, I think, will that also impact Canada? And when I think about in this context that we're in, in US, we have understood when I trace and I start to do research and I'll share some with you, that the profession is headed in the opposite direction. When you get into sort of senior levels in architecture, 
the profession is not very diverse and it's not very gendered. It's not, you know, equally gendered. So what I'm really concerned about with all of these very, very diverse millennials, millennials that are emerging right now in schools, the most diverse generation in history, there is a disconnect between those who are designing and teaching and practicing uh, around the built environment and the user group. And that's really where I would like to spend my energy in this profession. So let me take you through a little bit of our work or the mechanisms uh, that we do our architecture work through. On the left hand side, you see the Indigenous Design Collaborative, our vision there, and that's my Arizona State University Research Center. We are preparing the next generation of designers to act as field transformation ambassadors through the power of place design and cultures based innovation. Our mission, as you can see, is, met, is multi, uh, there are multiple parts to our mission. We are aiming to increase understanding, increase inclus inclusiveness and accuracy in the field while illuminating undervalued and underexamined ancestral worldviews and value systems that may contribute to global transformation. On the right hand side, you see my practice. We're about eight or nine, um, uh, designers at this point. And it's hard to call our firm an architecture firm. I call it instead a space of possibility, plurality, relationality, collaboration, agency, and resilience. And the focus that we work on, you see on the screen, we delve into Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing. We also delve into very collaborative methods. Number three, we're about mentorship of the next generation. We engage in a multi-generational approach. I am sandwiched in between the youth and the elders uh, that we work within. It's a really phenomenal place to be in my perspective. And we focus on, on Earth-centric design. Today, what I want to talk to you about are four main categories, fall into four main categories. The first, I want to define for you what is Indigenous mean to me, and it's a very broad definition. Then I'll define what I think Indigenous architecture is, and I'll use a definition that is fantastic, um, created by a New Zealand scholar. Next, I will talk about what I'm noticing in terms of field change. I call it pluriverse rising. Then I'll talk about our projects, but I'll talk about it through cultural sustainability theory, because I think that's one of those theories that um, it kind of woke me up um, a couple of years back when I read a paper. I realized that when I didn't feel part of, you know, the traditional um, realm of architecture, learning cultural sustainability theory allowed me to position myself within architecture and to know that this work is architectural work. So it changed everything. And then finally, I'll show, share a bit about our method. People are all, often curious about our method. And so I'd like to share a little bit of that today. I think it'll clarify a lot of things. So let's talk about what Indigenous design is. This definition, or what, you, what Indigenous means to me first, before I just define design. This definition was provided by United Nations. As you can see, um, most of those uh, one to six are in black. And the last one in orange are, is what I want to bring up. To me, and th this is why this connects to architecture, is that Indigenous people resolve to maintain and reproduce ancestral environments and systems as distinctive people and communities. If you read the other six, they seem that they could apply to many people who are struggling with number seven. I think of Dubai, I think of Shanghai, I think of all of the quickly developing um, regions around the world where local people are losing their culture and unable to connect to those important built environments that um, their culture is based in. Let's talk about the potential reach of Indigenous design. Right now, there are around 370 million Indigenous people around the world. In Canada alone, there are 634 First Nations, and that doesn't count all of the Métis nations, the non-federally recognized nations, and the Inuit communities. In the US, there are 573 at this point, federally recognized. 
How many Indigenous architects are there? There are only 18 in Canada, it might be a few more by now, and about 30 in the US. So we have a long way to go to be able to have ambassadors that are versed in all of those home communities. What you see on screen is a definition of Indigenous architecture. It was created by an Indigenous scholar called Hidini Matungo, who is based in New Zealand. He is a planner, but he wanted to theorize on Indigenous architecture, and I we love his definition. What I'm going to show you next, after we go through this definition, is another definition he created a few years later. So in this first definition he created, he's talking about really lovely things, you know, cultural values, knowledge and principles, geography, climate. He's also talking about a connection to natural resources, materials, and local construction methods. He also mentions in that second bullet point that some of these materials are introduced and the technologies and approaches are introduced. And I think that's important because it suggests an allowable adaptation that Indigenous people are working through at this time. In the last bullet point, he talks about an architecture ultimately redolent of their narrative, their relationships with place, now and into the future. A few years later, he writes again another definition, and this time he creates a system to create Indigenous architecture. Why is this so profound to me? Now, I believe, because we get asked a lot, can anyone create Indigenous architecture? And now I can say, yes, you can. Here is the roadmap to creating Indigenous architecture. It's not an easy roadmap, but we'll go through some of these pieces today. But I, what I think is most important is that, yes, this is a tall order, but if you put two or three of these to the test in an architecture project, let's say you connect to an archetype, the teepee, or you connect to the hogan, and you allocate, you know, you connect to cultural and social values and maybe a cosmology of a local people, maybe it's indigenous design light. So maybe there's a deep and a light to this work, but I think this is very fantastic that now we actually have a roadmap of what it is. In terms of, I guess, before we get into the meat of the matter, I wanted to share with you, I guess, what my aspir what I believe are aspirational outcomes for Indigenous design, and what I think it brings to the world, which is what gets me very excited. And I think that it brings new meaning to the profession of architecture, it brings new methods to how we create architecture, and it brings new responsibilities. Let me just share with you what I mean by those three. So in terms of new meaning, because this work is very place-based, uh, I think there's uh, an, uh, an enlargement of our understanding of each of the regions and biomes and places in this world by delving into the Indigenous um, views on architecture. It's also value-based. You know, Indigenous communities run a lot um, alongside value systems, and we're starting to notice values coming into play. For instance, Harvard, who has an urban research lab, is starting to look at value systems as leading design in urban cities. And it made me ask the question, could values also lead design generally? I think so. Finally, in terms of new meaning, I think it goes broader. It's, it kind of goes, Indigenous de design goes beyond, beyond the capitals. You know, typically we judge Indigenous architecture by using economics and aesthetics. The third thing that the new meaning brings is Indigenous architecture has typically relied on economics and aesthetics. And we believe that there's a lot um, a lot more capitals that we could tie into with this work. In terms of new methods, I think what is really important is the ability to power shift, right? We're giving agency back to the communities. We're integrating lived experience of the people in each community. We're recognizing that there's a mutual learning process between the architect and the user group, which I think typically in the past, it's been more one-sided. We believe that in terms of new methods, we drive our projects through a concept of reciprocity where we're bringing back to the home community. And finally, we're aiming to make each project transformative or bring positive change to the home community. In terms of the new responsibilities that it's bringing forth, 
I believe it brings a, a longer view uh, that we can start to look, you know, the Indigenous worldview talks about seven generations into the future. And I think that's a positive way to look at the world is bringing seven generations, a seven generation worldview forward. It reminds us that we're part of a custodial relationship to the environment. And through this work, it allows us to understand that the integrity of the land family is the most important aspect that we can work through. So with that, I want to move on to the field transformation, the pluriverse rising section. In terms of architectural training, we seem to have, um, I guess, a reliance on methods that have been um, um, promoted far back a hundred or so years ago. The master tutor, the willing servant, privileging of the visual, raising individuals onto pedestals, but the underlying systems remain unchanged. The core is left unchallenged. The post-millennial generation, as I mentioned before, is already the most racially and ethnically diverse generation in history. Meanwhile, the profession of architecture becomes less representative as experience increases. I did a bit of research to see really what are the statistics these days, and it is true, 72% of architecture professionals are are Caucasian. And the, a study that was done recently by ACSA, or the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, was entitled, Where Are My People? So this is becoming a recurring issue that is happening in architecture schools. Fortunately, there are a number of emerging cohorts that are starting to come out you can see on the map on screen, the first one to come out was in 2011, the, U the UNM or U University of New Mexico Indigenous Design and Planning Institute. Second was Laurentian University. They have a really cool indigenized program. They build canoes and they build ice huts. Um, so it's very applied learning. They have elders in residence and everything. We were third on the list, the Indigenous Design Collaborative. We were followed by UNM. They created more of a student association there. And then finally, Harvard Graduate School of Design started to create, a group of students came together to start to explore Indigenous design. So I see it starting to emerge in a number of um, institutions across North America. I'm also starting to see signs that, oh, and I apologize, my mouse is grasping on. I'm also starting to see signs that there are global ethnoscapes emerging across North America and internationally. Recently, I found an architect in Bolivia, well, it's an artist turned architect, he's indigenous. He created the house that you see on the left, very unique. There's a waiting list for this artist's work. Does that look like what we're teaching in architecture schools? No, is it right? Sure, it is. If people are waiting in line for this, there's something about this. The middle picture is New Zealand. They created this beautiful, uh, a beautiful system called Te Aranga, which brings Indigenous, the Maori principles from New Zealand, and it sets uh, a series of principles for designing in cities. Wonderful. Last year, we worked with the city, um, well, it was actually the uh, Hawaii, the, the state of Hawaii. It was a school board there that was worried that they were losing culture. And they were wanted us to come and do placekeeping work. And as you can see, the little office that we were in, you took off your shoes and you put your feet on the turf grass. And it was about changing the, our view of the built environment to a more indigenized perspective. So let's talk about what it would take to change the core. So what I'm going to show you here are seven tenets of cultural sustainability theory. Again, these, this is the theory. I read a paper. It was about uh, five or so years ago. And when you have that aha moment that all of a sudden something makes sense. This for me was the paper that made everything came together. I'm going to talk through seven, of, seven projects from our firm while I go through the theory of cultural sustainability theory. 
What you see on screen is the Colorado River Indian Tribe Justice Center. The first tenet of CS theory is that the use of space is influenced by our cultural backgrounds. This is a justice center designed to accommodate restorative justice. For Indigenous people, this means um, it's more about rehabilitating the people that are in this center instead of penalizing the people and, and making a very uncomfortable space. So you see from what you see on screen, it's a very nature infused space. It was a space for coming together and gathering, um, a very comforting space filled with natural materials. There are plants, there are water, there's natural light. And for us, it was important to recognize that Spatial behavior is culturally specific. The next example I show you is probably closer to home for many of you. This is across from the Parliament. That's the Indigenous People Space in Ottawa. And the second tenant of cultural sustainability theory, theory says human needs and environmental attributes are complex and if aligned well, lead to increasingly complementary functionality. Well, we were given a colonial building to redesign. There were three Indigenous architects involved in this project, Dave Fortan, Aladia Smoke, and myself. And um, I joke around that after we wiped our tears away from our drafting boards, after being given a colonial building to create an Indigenous um, building from, um, we got to work. Thankfully, we realized that the exterior of the envelope was failing. It's a very old building, as you know, and um, we thought, well, if we wrapped it in a thermal container, we would actually assist in the energy efficiency of this building, while at the same time giving us an opportunity to create an expression that is more about us. In terms of the needs that we were trying to connect to, of course, besides expression and representation, which, you know, there are many things happening on the exterior of that building, um, and I'll share with you a few, the little, um, some people see snowshoes, other people see leaves, some people see lacrosse sticks, it can be all of those things. To us, we wanted to create a little um, item for each of the nations across Canada to leave their mark on a building that is across from the Parliament. You see the sort of shawl that wraps around that building, to us it's a gift. The shawl is a gift and it, it represents many things to us, and so we wanted to incorporate a shawl. And then, of course, the people of that region, their precedent is the wigwam. And we thought, well, let's reference the wigwam in as a starting point for our design. In terms of addressing the um, behaviors, you know, aligning um, functionality in terms of needs and environmental attributes, we created a series of gathering spaces. You see here a gathering space on the upper level, on the lower level with a sacred fire, which is the image on the right, and on the lower left hand side, there's also a gathering space in that interstitial area between the building and the new, uh, the new co cover. To us, gathering is important and that is a functionality that's important to explore in a city. The next project I bring you is the Swan River Cultural Center and that's in Northern Alberta, Canada. And the tenant for cultural sustainability says, I love this one. It says there are ideological, social and behavioral meanings that need to be understood, including high level meanings such as worldview, mid-level meanings such as identity and low level meanings such as use. And this, these three points in there, worldview, identity and use have become a, a guiding system every time we think of a building we try and make sure that worldview identity and use is considered the community saw is it google or apple that had that big circular building um, somewhere in the u.s and our clients saw that and loved the design of course the circle is very relevant to many cultures across north america and asked if we could emulate that shape and we said sure but we wanted to of course give it identity and to make sure the functionality worked with the community. And so you see in the inside of that building there, it's hard to tell, but there are, an, there's a medicine wheel in the very center. It's an enclosed space that the children can play. But on the outside of the benches, you see a number of words inscripted on the benches and they are the concepts of the 13 moons. So it's connecting to the worldview or the cosmology of this particular community. And the building in this case becomes a teaching tool. When kids enter that building, they see the Cree word and they see the meaning and then the, the community members can share with them 
the importance of the 13 moons and how it relates to their culture. So it's preserving that, that, um, those cultural traditions. Number four, what you see on screen is St. Francis Cree Bilingual Elementary School in Saskatoon. And the tenet of CS theory says, outside or exogenous decision-making either undermines or reinforces cultural systems. So for us, designing an elementary school in the city of Saskatoon, of course, you know, we have a long tradition of, I guess, negative associations with educating our youth, our, our Indigenous youth, a long history of uh, boarding schools and residential schools in North America. And the elders and the parents came together and they said, we want something completely different. And so I had to push back against the school board who asked, why are we creating a building that looks nothing like any of the other schools in Saskatoon? And we said, we're trying to change the paradigm. We're trying to increase success of our uh, early learning um, students in the city of Saskatoon by changing the environment. And despite the fact that we got a bit of pushback, the school is actually going into construction this year. And most importantly, all of the traditional ways of teaching and learning and were brought into the design of that school. So for instance, there are central performance areas to host gatherings. There are ceremonial spaces for elders to come together with parents and students. There are um, outdoor applied learning spaces in the yard outside. There's a greenhouse to grow traditional plants. So it's a very, very different um, uh, elementary school and we couldn't have gotten there if the powers were left to the school board. So number five, what you see on screen is the Western University Indigenous Learning Center. We were given that um, circular building in the distance to renovate to create a space for Indigenous students and they wanted an outdoor gathering space. There wasn't a garden, there wasn't a descent into that lower level, but we thought it was really it would be really helpful if the spaces inside could relate to the natural world. The tenant that you see from the CS theory says that there are culturally specific understandings of what it means to be well and after talking to the Indigenous students at the university and the administrators and uh, the faculty there, wellness had many meanings. It included being outdoors, it included learning from the environment, it included gathering, it included storytelling, and we knew then that the spaces would have to be much different. So we created a cavernous um, descent into the lower level, adding a lot of natural light into that bottom space. And that garden that will exist here will be a space to teach about Indigenous plants to, for the Indigenous students. It would also offer them a place to connect with their culture outside, have a moment of reflection, which is so important. In the interior of that space, there are many non-typical spaces. The space in the lower right-hand side is a space for gathering and storytelling. It's complete with fire and Indigenous artwork in a circular shape. The space in the upper right-hand side is the welcome lobby. And what you see on screen, these tall vertical elements are uh, uh, echo of the archetype of that region, which are the palisades, which used to protect the camps. Um, and we use that to create greeting, welcome greeting, uh, greeting words in each of the languages of that region to welcome people into that space, knowing that institutional educational spaces need a little bit of, um, I guess, a welcoming feel because we have a, a bit of a challenging history with institutions in Canada. The diagram you see on the right, we have equinox and solstice lines that are ingrained into the floor and we created windows so that those directions could be recognized relating to our belief systems. There's the east entrance and then of course you see the, um, the arbor outside in the garden that leads to the bottom. The second from last project is um, a project here closer to home. This is Hayden Library over at Arizona State University. We were asked to do a welcoming project within um, the, the library. We again focused on languages, all of the surviving languages in Arizona. There are 22 in total. And what we did is we asked Indigenous artists to come and create the calligraphy for us to create these welcome greetings, a very cool, you know, sort of uh, a, a modern take on a welcoming um, that is designed for 
you know, 22 and 24 year olds at a university. The cultural sustainability tenant says that architects are members of cultural groups enculturated within a social value systems and that the impact of decision making and power structures, structures matter. And so in this case, we had a lot of trouble getting graffiti on the walls of a university. I convinced them we had to undo a little, make it not too extreme. We had to kind of straighten up the letters a little so that it would be more legible. And that was fine. But we managed to get the project pushed through. And we also got to do a second project. And now we're doing a third project in the library. We designed a table as our second project. Um, and it was done in association with an artist. It was using the basketry, which are very important. They hold a lot of stories in this region that we're in, in, in Arizona. And so it is a storytelling table that exists now in the Hayden Library. So for any of you that are coming to Arizona, please come and take a look at this table. It is absolutely stunning. And the artist, he's now in the news from this table. The last tenant of our Indigenous, um, um, the, the last tenant of cultural sustainability theory, and again, now, well, obviously this isn't one of our projects, this is an old project here from this region, Chaco Canyon, but I brought it because I think it really illustrates this last important point, which I think is what we're aspiring to with Indigenous architecture, and it says, Places are highly symbolic and culturally specific with cosmological, spiritual, and historical references that become identity markers for groups, societies, and nations. And I think with that said, I think this is a really beautiful sort of encompassing statement through this theory that tells us what we're really aiming to do, which is to accentuate or I guess uplift um, cultural properties in all buildings that we do. So let's talk, the last section of this presentation is about how we do this work. And this is, people are often very curious, how long does it take to do all this research and so forth? And we're, we're getting through, um, we're making, finding a lot of shortcuts in this work. So let me take you through some of those shortcuts. So what I think is necessary in this field, and this is something I've been sort of wrestling with, um, because there wasn't a thing called Indigenous design, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I think what we really need to do to really um, uplift in a meaningful way is to retool and to re-aggregate. So for retooling, it means to alter something, to make it more useful or suitable. And to re-aggregate means to bring elements or fragments together in a different way. So let me take you through each of these. This is what we um, use as our architectural process. It's, we call it the swirl. Typically with an indigenous project um, process, they just start here in the design section. For us, we think it's important to do place-based research first. We do everything from understanding the history and the archetypes to the you know, worldview about ecologies, meaning and materiality, a number of things. We hold that in our back pocket before we go into community, just so we're a little bit more familiar with who the community is. Then you see number four on the screen. We invite, we enlarge our group, inviting elders, artists, youth, cultural bearers to help us to understand. Then number five, we go through a community engagement process where we um, undertake a series of exercises, open-ended conversations, focus groups, um, to be able to understand what we can uplift and what the community wants to uplift. Of course, all of this is done in very close connection with the local community. At the end of all of our, you know, I guess you could call it a research phase, we create a series of design drivers, which are sort of big buckets, kind of principles that lead the work. Then only then do we start the design work. And in the end, I think what also makes our process different is at the end, we create a storytelling booklet where we can share all of our learnings with the home community, but also with all of the multitude of people that are, might be working with us on a project. We measure the outcomes of our work. So at the beginning of every project, we create a series of impact measurements to which at the end, we measure our work by. And we will go back and recreate if we don't hit our measurement <laughs> um, standards. And then, yes, there is a building that is produced as well. People often ask me what we connect to when we're going into community for the community-led teachings. And all this is a living research project that we are underway 
almost on a weekly basis, trying to understand how to categorize and codify all of the information that comes out from these meetings. But what I wanted to share with you are the start of our categorization of what we're connecting to and what we're listening for when we go in community. And you'll see in the right-hand column, Indigenous worldviews, Indigenous science and ecology, and meaning, and that can come in a multitude of sources, sources, including materials to markers, to land use patterns, to symbology. So all of that is what we're really trying to categorize right now in order to bring um, all of this work into a more cohesive whole so more people can join us on this mission of Indigenous design. And with that, I'm hoping that that has provided enough to bring forward a number of questions and have a conversation because I'm very, very happy to invite a conversation with you all today. So thank you so much for your attention today and I welcome uh, feedback, comments and questions. Hi, hi. Thank you so much for that, Londa. That was absolutely wonderful. Uh, and it was just so terrific. It's so amazing to see to see your work, to see your your the ideas underlying your work, the, the process processes by which you you arrive at those designs. And not only is it beautiful to see the work, but I have to say something that really struck me was that there is such a breadth of of vision here. And to me, it strikes a really deeply optimistic note. And, and I have to say, uh, you know, to be frank, for people living in Ottawa at this precise moment in history, striking that optimistic note is, is not, it's not, it's been a little elusive lately, I have to confess. And so to see your work, to understand some of the ideas behind it and understand the aspirations behind it is really, really inspiring. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, uh, for, for those in the audience, my name is Peter Kaufman. I'm an architectural historian. I'm supervisor of the History and Theater of Architecture program at Carleton University. I'm, I'm moderating this Q&A and I'll invite everybody to put your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Please use the Q&A rather than the chat because I, um, I won't be able to easily monitor both. And while people are thinking about that and writing down some questions, I just want to kick off if I may want to with a question, but a very, very broad stroke, strokes question. And it was uh, triggered by something you said very, very early in your talk when you said one of the things that you have missed in the pandemic is walking the land with your clients and establishing that relationship both with them and with the places. And that reminded me of something I saw that I've never forgotten. Several years ago, I saw a presentation by a, an Inuit artist, a remarkable Inuit artist named Matthew Duginkak. And something he said that has stayed with me ever since then was very simple statement almost made in passing we don't own the land the land owns us and in the in the research i do as a as a historian which looks at a lot of uh, british empire architecture throughout the world i mean th th there's a culture that says the opposite we own the land and it has struck me <laughs> that there's a fundamental difference there between in the relationship of one culture to the land and the other culture to the land. And I'm wondering, do you see that difference? And if so, how does it inform architectural design if there are any ways you can, you can pinpoint? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, and I think this is one of the hardest things that, um, one of the disconnects that I felt in architecture school. I remember my architecture, um, one of my studio profs telling us that the only way that the environment or the, the world becomes evident is if we create a window to look at the environment. And I thought, oh, that's completely backwards <laughs> from the way I think of it, where you start with the land, right? It's the base of everything we do. And in our culture, we have a concept called ethical relationality, which is about be working in a good way and you know, living in a good way and having every living thing around us um, recognized for the fact that it contributes to that entire um, holistic creation of life on earth, right? All of the living things are all dependent on each other, including us, we're part of that. And so to 
push ourselves out and above, you know, above that hierarchy or above that lack of hierarchy um, is, is really, I think, is, is puts us in discord with the natural world. And I think, if anything, this work is about increasing the awareness of the natural environment and all of the living things that exist within that natural environment. And so I think of a couple of books that recently came out that are starting to get this perspective. Low Tech was one that was released by Julia Watson. I'm sure you've seen that book, um, where she looks at the worldviews of Indigenous people around the world and their vernacular intelligence of the way they build and how they build an association in, in um, collaboration with the land and all the living things. And she's trying to bring that back today. And so I think there is a movement. I think, you know, I am hopeful that, um, but the attention that Indigenous design is getting, not only in North America, but worldwide, I think could change the conversation immensely. And if we start to, you know, sort of pinpoint on that, the intelligence that lives within each of the biomes around the world, I think that's a great place to start. Thank you. And again, I appreciate that optimistic note, because certainly the, the, the sensibility of, we own the land has outlived its usefulness, to put it very mildly. Um, I should, uh, I want to get to the questions because they're starting to pile up in uh, the Q&A. So I'll start with this one. You mentioned how fringe, I, I think your word was niche, indigenous, indigenous architecture has been historically. The question that most naturally and inevitably springs from that reasonable assertion is, how has Douglas Cardinal impacted that and indigenous, and indigenous architecture in general? Um, to what degree were you influenced by his work before you started practicing afterwards and both, or uh, both rather? Yeah, well, and I think if you asked any of the 18 or 20 indigenous architects in Canada, we look at him as our leader in this work. You know, he was one of the, he was the first out of the gate and um, we are all so thankful for him. And not only the, the fact that he has become, um, you know, well known across Canada, but if you read his early proposals, they look nothing like, um, they look nothing like the intention, the, with the, how we write, you know, how you respond as an architect to RFPs and we write these proposals and we try and win the job by creating this sort of, um, uh, a statement of why they should hire us and I remember reading they publicized one of his statements and it was so different from what you normally would write to get an architecture job and since that moment I was completely inspired because he was an outcast not only did he you know get told at UBC when he went to UBC that he wasn't from the you know the right family to become an architect you know he wasn't in the right circle so he moved from UBC down to, I think he went to study at Texas and then he went back. He was just so um, out of the, the circle of typical architectural practice, you know, being sort of an outcast in his work, but he kept on. And in the end, that's what he became famous for, right? He didn't follow what the norms were and what the conventions were. He just went on his own. And I think that in itself is inspiring. And so, yes, to answer your question, he is a, a phenomenal inspiration for all of us in Canada. Great question. Great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, next question. Would the Canadian First Nations have preferred an open space such as on the Breton Flats to design a national centre rather than that old double colonial piece of architecture on Wellington Street that was the American Embassy? <laughs> I think we would have preferred anything that wasn't a colonial building and an outdoor space that had a natural setting. Yes, that would be fantastic. But I think what was so powerful about that site and which elicited you know, such a, a, a reaction from three indigenous architects um, was its prominence across from the parliament. It wasn't lost on us that we knew that all of the parliamentarians would actually look out their window and see a building that was very different from the rest of Ottawa. We wanted to create a really bold concept and I think the reason why that was also really important is that, you know, people think of Indigenous people as part of the past. And, you know, we're not really still here. And so we wanted to create something so bold that people couldn't forget that we are still here and we might not look like the stereotype that you imagine us to be. And so I think it's, it's location almost um, created such a bold um, 
a bold project. If we would have been in a natural setting, not across from the parliament, we might have had a very different building. It, it would have been interesting and more earth centric, but I think this one served a purpose in, in being right across from the parliament. That is so interesting. And it's interesting to say that your first response would be almost anywhere but there. And I completely understand that because I have to admit, I was among those when, when it was announced that that would be the function. I was among those who were frankly cringing because it's a building, I mean, essentially it's a Renaissance palazzo. I mean, every, every stone and mortar joint in there sort of exudes Western triumphalism. And I thought, my goodness, is this really the best we can do? But then I saw your design and I thought, well, maybe this is actually redeemable after all. But when, when you first, when you showed it, you talked about tears. I'm not sure if you were being absolutely literal or metaphorical or, or <laughs> quasi humorous there, but can you just say a bit about how you overcame what seems to have been the initial shock that I think I, I sort of got to yeah. uh, and how you overcame that and, and, and turned it around into something positive? Yeah, and we, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an uh, eternal optimist. I think you have to be in this field, in this world that we're in today. And um, I think part of the early conversations that the three of us had, we had two polarized opinions. Let's knock the old building down, which of course would have caused ripples in Ottawa, because it is a historic building. And then there was another part of us that said, let's keep it because it's a piece of our Canadian history. You know, the process of colonization, what happened to the Indigenous people, you know, MMIW, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, treaties, reconciliation, this is all part of our Canadian history and we can't forget it. And so to us, it was, let's capture this, this building, we'll wrap it, it was a moment in time, and we can all look back on it. When we know better, we do better. And I think it was important for us to encase it and keep it as a part of our Canadian history. Wow, yeah, so you can't, you can't forget it, but you can transcend it. Yes, exactly. And I think, you know, there was a big part of the program in that building for us. I mean, I'm sure it's totally changed it. We, our solution will not get built because um, Ottawa has decided that they're going to release the entire parcel, including that corner parcel, to one architect to do the entire block, is how I understand it. Um, we were not selected. Um, and so I don't think it will actually get built, but the document that we created with all of the principles and all of our research and the process will be given to the architect who does the next building. And we hope that some of our thinking um, and um, some of what we, we collected and what we thought about and would, would make it into the next um, iteration of that corner building, I, I hope. Okay, thank you for that. That actually answers the next question uh, in the Q&A, which was what the status of that was now, and uh, I hope you're right. <laughs> um, okay, for projects in the north in Canada, how do you embrace winter? I'm thinking of the building, of Sas building in Saskatoon, which is a significant outdoor space ideal for summer. How would it work in winter? We are winter people. That's a, this is a really good question because I'm fascinated by this question right now because we've all just spent two years in our house, right? We realize how important connections, not all kind of connections, but especially connections with the natural world. We started working with a Danish firm who's a landscape architect. They have, a, um, I guess, a, a principle in their work, which is about staying outside in cold weather. There's a word, they have a word for this. Um, you know, Canadians, I'm sure, could invent a word for this about how we go outside and ice skate and we ice fish and we walk in the cold and we do activities in the cold. It's part, it used to be part of our norm. It's very much something that is being brought back in countries in Europe where we are trying to find ways to design outdoor spaces that would become more comfortable in the winter to allow us to take part. And, uh, you know, an example, I went ice skating over um, the Christmas holidays and there's a great big fireplace outside. It was beautiful. We sat there drinking hot chocolate. We spent four hours outside, which is more than you normally spend. And it was wonderful. And so this Danish architect brought forward a number of strategies that are allowing people to live more comfortably in the outdoor space. They have something called winter sunning spaces, which is a surface that warms up in the winter sun you know, obviously the snow, you can do heat tracing, so the snow melts, 
where you can sit on a surface that is being warmed because we still have sun in the winter, even though it might be very cold, that you can sit in somewhat uh, mediated environments outside between fireplaces, capturing the sun, creating materials that you sit on that hold the thermal heat. There's a lot of work to be done in this area, right? Because I think if we all agreed, we want to be outside, regardless of the season, we want to be connecting. And so that school that you see in Saskatoon has a number of those outdoor features in it. We have outdoor um, a, a fire pit, we have outdoor winter sports in that outdoor area. We have outdoor seating areas. We even have a greenhouse on that south facing side in the outdoor so they can grow plants throughout the year. So this is, that's a great question. Yeah. I think that's so interesting. Of course, especially you were talking about the impact of, of the pandemic. Of course, in the last two years, it's been a, a sort of a, a real case study in how we need to figure out how to make outdoor spaces, outdoor gathering spaces in the winter in this country. So uh, that, that's great. Um, next question. What building materials do you like to use in these projects? Well, I, we start every project, you know, because our work is very place-based. I mean, obviously, uh, cold climate building is, is a complicated wall assembly that, you know, requires um, seasonal uh, adjustments. Um, but I think for us, we start with what, did the, what does the community relate to? So we have most Indigenous people recognize a number of sacred materials. Cedar is one of them. So we designed a building using cedar at one point, you know, it ages really beautifully and it turns kind of a gray color, which is just gorgeous. So we would normally go to sacred materials first, if we can use those, then we go to natural materials. What is the most natural material, wood species, stone species that can be um, harvested in the region around the project? Right. Instead of importing, you know, marble from, you know, Italy or uh, bricks from who knows where, we're really focusing on trying to make it very place based. We will also ask our community, you know, recently in that school that we that um, the question was just asked about St. Francis School inside there, we asked the local community, what are the wood species that have meaning to you? And we found out that pine, birch and poplar all have meaning. And there was one tree species that actually brought trauma that they aff affiliate that material from residential school. So it's sometimes important to ask what materials should we use and what materials we should, should we not use. We have found a lot of um, Indigenous communities have a negative reaction against red brick because of all the boarding schools and residential schools were made out of red brick. And even the color, do you remember inside, um, if, if you've ever toured one of those old residential schools, they had a, that salmon color of flooring, you know, the, the um, resilient flooring. We've heard in other meetings, never use that color in any building that you're doing. So the, it's important part of the, our process to not only identify which materials have meaning, but also which materials could be connected to negative historical associations. So this is, that's a really great question because I think materials can also connect us as human beings to the natural world. And that's really what we're trying to do. That is so interesting. And it actually, it, it relates to the very first question I asked you and the, the, you know, we don't own the land or we do own the land because uh, the Hagia Sophia, which coincidentally was commissioned exactly 400, 1,490 years ago today, they deliberately used marble from all the different parts of the empire to sort of encapsulate every the whole empire and everything they owned in that one building. You know, we own the land, whereas, whereas the, the, the emphasis you're talking about local materials, sacred materials, and I assume sacred materials would be largely local, is again, it's such a completely different understanding of our relationship to a place and, and a different kind of architecture grows from that understanding yeah and you know recently we did a number of shade structures here in Arizona and we connect we asked what their keystone we call it a keystone species um, you know which is it's a, a species from the environment that has really uh, uh, deep meanings and we found out it was something called arrowweed which was a grass which they used to put on the top of their buildings to shade you know if you've ever been to Phoenix in the middle of the summer shade is 
critical to survival. But we also found out that this material, this grass material was not growing anymore because a lot of the water's been diverted and then, you know, the patterns are changing. So we got, we started a project to think about harvesting arrowweed again and starting to think through that relationship of arrowweed, arrowweed through the history of this place, right? It tells its own story. And just the fact that there's a shortage of this material in this region is just an, an alarming, I guess, an alarming bit of information that we shouldn't forget about. How many other Indigenous people are losing their keystone species and their sacred materials because of changes in our environment? And with those loss of materials goes the loss of traditions, the loss of worldview, the loss of life ways, and so forth. So it's it's much more serious, I think, than the notion of materials than we kind of think about nowadays, where you can just order things online and they get delivered to your house, right? <laughs> it's that kind of the opposite um, the polarization to that. Yeah, that's so interesting, and it actually, if, if I know, actually, we're tight for time. Can I can I give you one more question? Sure. That actually segues into one more question that's been posted here. Uh, and actually, I'll sort of uh, conflate it with a, a question I was going to ask you as well, if time permitted. Um, someone asks, I never heard the word sustainability used in the presentation, which, of course, you talked about cultural sustainability. Uh, yet the works shown were the very definition of human sustainability. And, and the question I asked you to comment on that, and that actually is sort of a slightly di different take on something I wanted to ask you, and that is, is there a... a, a connection between cultural sustainability and environmental sustainability well and i think you know just like i look at the definition of indigenous in a very broad way i look at the definition of sustainability as the ability to sustain and in that regard when i look at it from an indigenous holistic perspective there's a lot of requirements or a lot of elements that give us that ability to be sustained it could be cultural, spiritual, emotional, environmental, ecological. Um, it could even be political. It could be, um, um, you know, I think sustainability should be thought of more as a, a broader concept, you know, similar to um, the way we think about meaning. Remember the slide I shared about meaning in architecture. I think we need to broaden the definition of sustainability. If you look at some of the research that's been done, they are recently, I think um, GEL is one of the research bodies that's starting to look at that definition of sustainability and really increasing it. Oh, United Nations is also looking at it. And if you look on United Nations and Google the word sustainability, they have a matrix online that has about, I don't know, I, I guess at about 20 or 30 different components of what it means to sustain. So I think that is a really good way to look at the word sustainability and the term cultural sustainability. I think I connected to it, obviously, because the work I'm doing is about sustaining culture. But to me, it's much broader than that. I think, you know, in every project that we do, we can't just think about um, a building that functions to hold lifeways. I'm thinking about cultural preservation. I'm thinking about a teach, the building is a teaching tool. I'm thinking about seven generations in the future. I'm thinking about our youth. There's so many aspects that I think we shortchange ourselves when we think of, well, let's just create a building together or a building to, to sleep. I think there's a much broader um, metric that we can use to judge the success of architecture these days. Yes, thank you. And that is a wonderful note to end on because unfortunately we have to end because we're out of time. I could go all night, but I know you and I'm sure our audience have other commitments. But thank you again for that. That was just such a wonderfully uplifting and inspiring presentation. And I'm very, very grateful to you for it. And I also want to thank our, our audience uh, for your questions. If your question didn't get asked because we have run out of time, uh, by all means, please uh, send your question, email your questions to, uh, uh, to Heritage Ottawa and we're, we'll do our best to, uh, to send them on to our speaker. Uh, I just want to also remind the audience that, uh, as you may know, if you attended these before, a brief survey will be emailed to you tomorrow, and uh, the lecture will also be posted to YouTube shortly, so you'll get a chance to see it again and even better share it with others, because there are a lot of people who really, really should see what we've experienced tonight. 
I'll mention that our next Heritage Ottawa lecture will take place on March 16th, that's next month, and will be presented by Barbara Batrell. And Barbara will be taking us into rural Ottawa, where she'll share with us the hidden treasure of Fitzroy. And as with this one, on re online registration is required in advance, uh, but uh, there is, as usual, no charge. And finally, speaking of the fact that there's no charge for these lectures, uh, I, I would encourage you, if you are not already a member of Heritage Ottawa, to consider joining Heritage Ottawa. And if you like what you see, if you like what we're doing, then, then I would encourage you to consider donating to Heritage Ottawa as well, because obviously we're a nonprofit registered charity and it's uh, your support that really keeps us going. So thank you again, Wanda. That was absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and I'm so grateful to you. And thank you so much to our audience. And I wish you all a, a wonderful night. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. And by the way, the word is hige. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but we have someone Danish in the audience. Pursuing joy and coziness in winter. So go out there and grab yourself some hige. <laughs>